While many people might think of microdosing for boosting mood, creativity, and productivity, did you know that one study found that it helped a substantial percentage of people to stop psychiatric and pain medications? We'll talk about that study and more in this episode on microdosing. Welcome back, my fellow psychonauts. I'm Dr. Tracy Kim Townsend. I'm a licensed medical doctor, licensed psilocybin facilitator, and I am on a mission to help expand consciousness on planet Earth. I'll be your guide as we navigate through the uncharted territories of the mind. As always, these videos are for educational purposes only. Today, we're venturing into the fascinating and controversial realm of microdosing. It's a practice that's captured the imagination of everyone from Silicon Valley innovators to mental health researchers. Is it a breakthrough in human potential or just a placebo effect? Let's find out. First off, let's ask what exactly is microdosing? To fully understand, we're going to break it down into three key areas. What substances are typically used and how? Who's doing it and why? And what does the latest research tell us? Microdosing is the practice of taking extremely low doses of classic psychedelics like LSD or psilocybin, doses so small that they're technically sub-perceptual. You don't experience the obvious effects typically associated with taking a big trip. No big visuals, no intense emotional experiences. The intention is a subtle shift in your normal state of consciousness, perhaps an enhancement of mood, cognitive function, and creativity. This is in contrast to a completely altered state. If we think of taking a macrodose of psychedelics as diving into the deep end, then microdosing is like dipping your toes in the shallows. When properly executed, microdosing should not cause hallucinations or make you feel high. If you're experiencing these effects, then your dose is likely too high. How much are we really talking about? And how often are people doing this? A microdose is about one tenth or one twentieth of a full macrodose. So for LSD, the typical microdose ranges from five to 20 micrograms. With psilocybin mushrooms, we're looking at about 0.1 to 0.5 grams of whole dried psilocybin containing mushrooms. As for frequency, most microdosing regimens follow a cyclical pattern. A common one is the Fadiman protocol, named after psychedelic researcher James Fadiman. It goes like this, day one, microdose day. Day two, observe the after effects. Day three, rest and then repeat. Some people follow a weekday protocol, microdosing on work days and then taking breaks on weekends. And still others will microdose once a week, maybe once a month. Regardless of the protocol, it's recommended to schedule at least two to four weeks of a washout period or break after a microdosing cycle of four to eight weeks. This break or reset is vital to avoid tolerance and thus maintain the healing effects of microdosing psychedelics. Now that we understand what microdosing is, let's explore who's actually doing it and why. The first group we have is professionals and entrepreneurs. Meet Sarah. She's a 32-year-old startup founder. She says that microdosing helps her problem solve, stay focused, and maintain a healthier emotional relationship to her work. Next, we have creatives and artists. Imagine Alex. He's a 28-year-old screenwriter. He experiments with microdosing to boost creativity and break through artistic blocks. Students and academics are another key group. Take 22-year-old grad student James. He's finding that microdosing helps him stay focused during long study sessions and grasp difficult theoretical concepts. There's another group, the biohackers and self-optimizers. Meet Raj. He's a 40-year-old mindset coach. He sees microdosing as a tool for enhancing personal development and interpersonal relationships. And now for the group that I believe has potentially the most to benefit from microdosing, we have those who are addressing mental health concerns. Consider Emma. She's a 35-year-old dealing with depressive symptoms. Emma reports that microdosing helps stabilize her mood and increase her emotional resilience. Now let's look at how microdosing might actually affect the brain. Keep in mind the underlying mechanisms for how microdosing might work are all theoretical and largely extrapolated from the studies on macrodoses. What we do know is that classic psychedelics like psilocybin act via the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor primarily. Serotonin has been the main transmitter implicated in depression and anxiety disorders, hence the conventional treatment with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs. The downstream effects of 5-HT2A serotonin receptor activation includes an increase in neurotrophic factors. Neurotrophic factors are a family of biomolecules that support the growth, survival, and differentiation of both developing and mature neurons. This is also known as neuroplasticity. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, is one such factor. It is highly expressed in limbic brain regions, which are involved in emotional processes, memory, and mood. BDNF is thought to be lower in disorders 
related to neuroplasticity, such as in patients with major depressive disorder. And microdosing has been shown to increase plasma levels of BDNF. So a simplified way to represent this might be taking a psychedelic leads to 5-HT2A receptor activation, which leads to increased BDNF, increased neuroplasticity, and improved mental health symptoms. While these reported benefits sound promising, it's really crucial to separate the anecdotal evidence from scientific facts. So let's dive into what the latest research actually tells us about microdosing. Rigorous scientific studies are still in their very early stages. The current evidence for microdosing is limited, mostly due to the fact that psychedelics are still classified as a Schedule I substance, making them very difficult to study in a clinical setting. The current research that we have on microdosing is a mix of self-reported surveys, qualitative studies, which are essentially interviews with microdosers, prospective observational studies that track the experiences of microdosers in a naturalistic setting, also known as regular life, and laboratory studies that investigate the effects of microdoses administered in a controlled setting. That being said, Let's explore what researchers have uncovered so far. First, we have this study published in 2020, the one that I mentioned at the start of this episode. This was an online survey that examined over 1,100 people who had experience with microdosing either psilocybin or LSD. The researchers found that 89% found microdosing helpful for mental health versus 65% for counseling and 35% for antidepressants. 51% stopped antidepressants, 40% stopped other psychiatric medications, and 28% stopped their pain medications. Many participants reported reducing or stopping recreational substance use. For example, 44% reduced their alcohol use. However, it's important to note that this was a self-reported survey, which obviously has its limitations. Still, it's an extremely interesting signal to pay attention to. Now let's look at a more recent study published in 2023. This was a randomized controlled trial design that involved 80 healthy male volunteers who took either LSD microdosis or a placebo every three days for six weeks. The key findings in this study were microdosing LSD appeared relatively safe and there were no serious adverse events. The four participants did withdrawal due to increased anxiety. Participants in the LSD group reported improved creativity, connectedness, energy, pro-social feelings, and mood on dosing days above the placebo control and even after accounting for some participants breaking the blind in the LSD group, which can introduce expectancy effects. This is fascinating because this study provides really rigorous evidence to show that microdosing is not just due to placebo effects. The effects are not big and it's limited by the focus on healthy males, but it formally meets the criteria for what the FDA considers to be an effective drug intervention. Researchers are continuing to explore several key areas, including cognitive effects like focus and memory, mood and well-being, particularly for depression and anxiety, creativity and problem-solving abilities, potential therapeutic applications for mental health conditions. However, the field faces several challenges, legal constraints due to the legal status of many psychedelics, placebo and expectancy effects, lack of standardization and dosing protocols, unknown long-term effects, So we've explored the potential benefits of microdosing, but now it's time to look at the flip side. While many microdosers report positive effects, it's crucial to understand the potential risks and controversies surrounding this practice. So let's start with the physiological risks. Some researchers have raised concerns over a theoretical risk that microdosing over long periods of time could lead to heart valve disease or cardiac fibrosis. This is thought to be linked to the activation of 5-HT2B receptors. Duration likely plays a very key role with risk increasing as courses of microdosing become prolonged into several months or years. So while we don't know for sure if microdosing poses this risk, it's purely theoretical at this point. It's something that researchers are keeping an eye on, and for now, it's probably safest to avoid microdosing for more than six to eight weeks at a time. Psychologically speaking, microdosing may trigger anxiety in some individuals. So for those with pre-existing mental health conditions, microdosing could potentially exacerbate your symptoms. Legally, microdosing inhabits a gray area. Most substances used for microdosing are still illegal in many countries. In the U.S., classical psychedelics like LSD and psilocybin are still Schedule One substances, meaning that the government has deemed them to have no medical use. However, realizing that this is just patently false, some cities and states have begun to decriminalize and legalize some psychedelics. For example, microdosing psilocybin in Oregon, where I practice, is now legal. As always, check your local laws. While microdosing shows promise, much more research is needed. Here are your mission critical takeaways as you go exploring your own psyche. Always prioritize your own health and safety and make informed decisions based on credible research and ideally with a trusted professional guide. 
In the end, the choice is yours and it should be an informed choice. Now I want to hear from you, my fellow psychonauts. What are your thoughts on microdosing? Have you had any experiences that you'd like to share? Please drop your questions and comments below and subscribe to our community newsletter. If you're curious about our next mind expanding topic, make sure to like the video and subscribe to our channel. It helps us grow. Check out the vetted resources in the description below. And remember that the journey of self-discovery never ends. Stay curious, stay safe, keep exploring responsibly.